Okay, so we have uh, one more perspective to, uh, to, to let you uh, listen to this morning, and this is uh, ostensibly from the GEM perspective. And uh, I use that word uh, ostensibly because, you know, we all kind of uh, are really studying the same object in this room, despite the diversity of techniques and uh, instrumentation and expertise that exists here. So all of this, uh, the things you're hearing really are just um, tools for us to talk uh, across the aisle, as it were, between CEDAR and GEM, but also amongst each other within the communities. So our last talk of the session will be given by Mike Limon. So I guess if I have one point to make, uh, it, it seems that you know, using the phrase system level science in, in, uh, you know, among our geospace colleagues, uh, that that phrase has, has been much maligned, and maligned to the point that system level scientists have taken to the streets in protest. And uh, th this is one of many pictures that I pulled off the web, you know, from the uh, <coughs> from the protests that have ensued. You know, and so I guess if there's one one point that I'd like to make, it's that uh, it's that we should be okay with this phrase in our uh, being added to our lingo. And that if you're talking to somebody out in the hallway, you should be, you know, it should be acceptable for you to use the phrase, hey, you know, I do system level science. Or if you're listening to a talk, you shouldn't scoff when somebody says the word system level science. Or, or if you're reviewing a paper or proposal, you shouldn't automatically, you know, go in with a negative impression that, you know, that this is a, an acceptable and even necessary part of our, of geospace research. Um, Another thing that I'd like to say is that this is actually the talk that I was asked to give here at a plenary session tutorial. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I, uh, I'm responsible for this content, but it's not all mine. I'd like to say that there's been, uh, you know, much of this is, actually comes from an ISSI team that uh, Eric Donovan and Mark Lester led um, about a year ago uh, on geospace, at, defining geospace at the system level. Okay, so in, in the magnetosphere community, I think that we can, you know, the two camps have sort of emerged, you know, out of that set that Dave Heisel was talking about. I'd say that there's really been, you know, we could sort of boil it down to, uh, to two main thrusts. One is the is a reductionist approach where we solve the different components of geospace and, and link those components together. And that we, we try and write down the equations and, and solve each of those components and then talk about the boundaries in between those as the system level coupling. Uh, in be, uh, of the system. The other uh, way to look at it is is with complexity theory, and that is uh, where where you sort of toss out the components completely. Uh, you know, this is the self similarity, the power law people. The, you know, trying to trying to look for some overarching um, dynamical state or you know governing behavior of the of the entire geospace system without actually worrying about the individual components that a reductionist uh, likes to think about. So, um, you know, and there they, you know, if they can boil something down to the slope of a power law that says something about the physics, but just that there is a power law says that for that range of the, of the uh, quantities that you're looking at, there's, there's a single governing set of, uh, of principles uh, defining that that range of of dynamical behavior. So uh, you know, the, so this split. You know, I, I said that there are protests. There's even protests between the reductionists and the complexity theorists. You know, the system level science can't even agree with itself. And so yeah, there's even more um, protests going on with that. And I guess what I'd like to say is, that, you know, we sh we should really just just fold down the you know back over the the top half of this and and say. You know, another world is possible. That we that we really should just you know uh, learn to talk about system level science as just one more aspect of what all of us do, or what some of us do, and, and that we don't have to do system level science. But those that do um, uh, shouldn't feel like like it's you know a, a fight to try and get their um, their view across. And I think, uh, like, as, as we've heard, many of us are already doing system level science uh, across geospace. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the reductionist side of things, because that's, I think, where, where I lie and, and many others in the room lie. Uh, you know, the basic meaning is that you, that you understand the component subsystems. And if you understand these components, then, then, you, you, have a, then you can just put the components together. And it's those boundaries, you have a system. Um, but as we heard, you know, just studying all the neurons isn't enough to, uh, to know about human behavior. 
Um, some built-in assumptions here is that, is that the system can be compartmentalized. Uh, you have your equations for each one of those and these inner regional couplings, all the arrows in between those are known and that, um, and that it's just at those boundaries where the things interact. So, so that's kind of a basic definition of you know, reductionism and I think that's what most of us would say that we do when we start talking about MI coupling or any region of coupling uh, is, is to take this approach right here. You know, so kind of the, the purest form is just, you know, to, to chop it up into its components. You know, we have the cow, you have the body of the cow, the head of the cow, and the legs of the cow. And, you know, if the cow wants to walk, the head tells the legs to do something. And, you know, and it's, it, there's an interaction there. And you can break down and draw a Bretherton diagram of the cow. So, <clears throat> uh, so what does that mean for, uh, you know, you assume that, that these things can talk to each other, and as long as the flow is, is one way, then you, know, you don't really need to know that the cow is, you know, even has a head. All you need to know is that there's information coming into the legs, and that if you have a boundary condition there and the legs are, are moving forward, you know, the, 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 sor the driving condition there, our solar wind, for instance, all you need to do is have that solar wind. In the MI coupling, all you need is the auroral precipitation. That's the driving condition. You, if you don't really need to, worry about the, the feedback back to the magnetosphere, if all you want is that driving, then you can just take that boundary condition from that point on and deal with your subsystem, uh, your component, and you don't really need to worry about a system level uh, approach at that point. Um, but what if it isn't? What if there's feedback? You know, what if, what if you know, if, and to take our cow, if the cow is hungry, then you know, the, its stomach is empty. The stomach tells the brain, hey, go find some food. Brain tells the legs, walk over there where there's grass. You know, the, <clears throat> the legs say, okay, we're here. You know, the eyes say, okay, we could eat. And the stomach is full. The stomach gets full. It tells the brain again to stop. And, you know, now, now the cow can wander off and go back to where it was. So, <clears throat> so there's, you know, there was a loop in there. And that each part of the components were talking to each other and responding to what the other components were doing. So what about geospace? We draw the cartoon and we nicely compartmentalize it. And I like this picture because it actually draws the different components in different colors even. You know, it's like broken down as, you know, to, a, uh, to, to a very regional level here. And you know, it's drawing the currents on top of that. Very few of the lines actually cross those color boundaries in this. It, you know, it, we have it nicely compartmentalized. And each of us can go ahead and study any one of these components in the, in the magnetosphere and, and you're perfectly fine, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a magnetosheath uh, researcher and you understand, you know, and you're trying to understand the, the physical behavior there, if the rest of it can simply be a boundary condition for you and you apply those boundary conditions, you're happy. You don't, you know, you, you don't have to take a system level approach. So I don't want to say that all of us need to become system level scientists. That isn't the point uh, of what I'm saying here. I want to say that if somebody does want to take more than just your own region into account, that's okay, and we should, <laughs> we should be okay with that as a community. Uh, so really, yeah, what, what does it define? When, you know, when, when somebody wants to do system-level science or needs to do system-level science, what is, you know, one defining uh, threshold that I would say is, is does it meet one of two or both criteria? One is, is there feedback in the system? Does doing something over here you know, the, the input from, from this hand going into this hand alter what this hand gives to, to, to the hand, to, to the other hand. So, so is there, is there some, some uh, information flow backwards or is it only one way? The other thing is time history. Do, does what this hand do two minutes ago influence what this hand is doing now? And, you know, there are some key examples of that. We already saw this plot up here. So this is the, the uh, feedback in the system that, that the, What's going on in the magnetosphere changes how the input from the solar wind influences uh, the magnetosphere. So that's, that's the saturation picture uh, that we just saw. Time history, we, we see that uh, a good example is the radiation belts. You know, what the state of the radiation belts right now does not depend on the driving conditions on the radiation belts right now. It, it depends on the accumulated driving conditions over many days even in the past. And, and you can see that, that oftentimes there's, you know, sometimes there's a sudden ramp up here, other times there's a slow ramp up. And, and it takes, it, you know, these are 
you can't read the scale down here, but, the, but there are many days, these are, are uh, geomagnetic storms happening over the course of, of several months across the bottom, or two months across the bottom here. And so, so days passing by as things are ramping up. So we do have some long time history influences within the magnetosphere um, and uh, that we need to take into account. So this is one attempt at a Bretherton diagram and uh, uh, for, for geospace. You, each of these columns on here could be those blocks and then the arrows, you know, this is, this is one attempt where the arrows actually had names put on and the colors are, are mass, energy, mass, energy, energy and mass <clears throat> and then the directions and some of these arrows are, are two ways. And so trying to, trying to put labels on all of those different interactions that are occurring out in geospace. Uh, again, defining the system. You know, th this is trying to define the entire geospace uh, magnetospheric uh, ionosphere system here. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot of different columns and a lot of different things, and if you tried to do all of this, you'd be staring at it for a while, and if you tried to do all of it to a, to a microscopic physical level, it would, uh, it would be very cumbersome in trying to address all of these different uh, processes. Yet, <clears throat> I think that we have models out there that do. This is, you know, in some sense, achieving all of this is, is the goal of the coupled models coming out of the Center for Integrated Space Weather Modeling. And uh, this is the, uh, one of the uses of this Michigan Space Weather Modeling Framework, is to try and address many of these things all at once and try and get at these different couplings. You don't have to necessarily go in and analyze the results of every particular model that was included in that big coupled simulation that you did, um, but you need to be aware that there are these couplings interacting and, uh, and if you're gonna try and do a big entire system level uh, analysis, you need to be aware of, of all these different interactions that could be influencing the result that you're getting out of your uh, simulation or, or uh, data analysis effort. So, but again, we don't have to define the system as the entirety of geospace. And I think that's, that's another um, uh, misperception in our community in that, you know, many of us do system level science because, you know, ev even when our system, again, it depends on how we define our system. And we can define our system as small as we want as long as we can boil it down into subsystems that have feedback and time history involved between them. And so let's just take a look at the inner magnetosphere um, at a system level approach. So, you know, one basic view of this is just take the interplanetary conditions, do some prediction of DST, and from that make a guess at the currents in near Earth space. And whether that's, you know, put ring current or tail or whatever word you want up there, just current morphology in, the, in, in near Earth space. You know, this, this, this first half right here is the Burton equation style predictions. And then the second half would be knowing what you know about currents and how the, the magnetic fields come off of that, and you make some guess at where those currents are. Um, this is a Bretherton diagram for the inner magnetosphere. It's a very simplistic one, and it's a fairly one-way flow uh, Bretherton diagram, but it is a, a diagram, you know, really Bretherton diagram is just a fancy word for block diagram. You know, we could, we could just use the word block diagram if we want, actually. We don't have to uh, take over the, uh, the Earth system uh, word for that. We can just call it, call it our own, you know, geospace diagram or whatever you want to call uh, for, for system level science here. Um, but we can get more complicated. We don't have to um, simply use this, you know, back on this one, we didn't really care about the, the individual neurons of the inner magnetosphere. We just wanted to solve, you know, one, one number for the entire inner magnetosphere. Well, let's say we didn't want to do that. We actually wanted to to solve some set of equations for, for the flow of particles. And so, okay, we take some interplanetary conditions, we impose some, some boundary conditions, and we calculate how the hot ions and electrons flow through the inner magnetosphere. Okay, and that gives us the, the uh, morphology of the currents in near Earth space uh, from how that flows. And that's, again, you know, you're, you're solving this uh, system through here. Still, one way flow into the system. But you can make it two way. Uh, you can add in 
uh, you know, electric field self-consistency. And now instead of, you know, when you calculate this, um, you have precipitation and currents flowing in to modify the electric field, which then perturbs the ring current. All right, now we have a feedback on the system. So, so now we're really starting, this, at this level, we're actually, you know, it's system science at this point, because now you're actually talking about two different subsystems interacting with each other back and forth with some feedback. We can add even more. Instead of just the electric field, we can have back and forth flow with the magnetic field, too. Uh, in the intermagnetosphere, and there are various models that do this intermagnetosphere magnetic field solution in conjunction with hot ion dynamics and the feedback between those two. And, and it's uh, feedback, uh, immediate feedback, as the, as the particles change, they change the magnetic field, which for the next time step changes uh, how the particles move. We can add time history into that by adding not just uh, feedback here, but large-scale reconfigurations that then change the plasma sheet source population, uh, which come into uh, this. This final curve that I've just drawn is not an immediate effect. This takes some time for, for solar wind entry, for ionospheric outflow, for acceleration down tail, and the particles to convect in. Um, so, so now we've added time history into the into the uh, block diagram. And this, you know, this is even more complicated. System level science, still just focusing on the intermagnetosphere. It's the system we've defined though, and we've added yet another layer of, co of uh, complexity on top of it. We can get really complicated with our block diagram, still focusing on the intermagnetosphere. But now, you know, if you really want to get into it, each one of the individual components of what's going on in the intermagnetosphere, all the different wave, all the different plasma populations, all the different um, fields in the intermagnetosphere can have their own block with their own arrow on top of it. And you can get rather complicated with your block diagram of your particular system. Or you can be really simple. Remember, we started out with a very three block, you know, simple system uh, <clears throat> uh, at the beginning of this. I'd like to say, you know, it, we can also, it, you know, take a step back. You don't even need to have blocks on your system. You can, you know, I think uh, uh, on Monday, Bill Lotko got up here and showed us the circuit diagram of geospace. Well, that's a reductionist version of, of uh, geospace at the system level. You're, you're defining, you know, instead of actually solving the equations within each of these components, you're boiling it down to, uh, to a circuit component for that. Uh, for that uh, part of, of geospace, and you solve a set of, of equations. And this, uh, you know, the, the WinMe model is one example of that. There are others out there, too, of course, um, uh, that is solving the entirety of geospace without having to deal with any first principles equations of how the particles are actually moving or how the fields are actually changing uh, in, uh, within the system. And, and I think that this is, you know, it, we don't all have to do this type of approach again. But I think it's a, a very useful component uh, to, the, to the larger body of geospace research and that we should be aware of this and, and let it inform us when we go on with our own uh, modeling and, uh, and analysis of, of the system. Uh, modes of geospace response, we talked, you know, there was a comment from uh, Dave Heisel about, you know, that there are, um, different states of the system and that these states, you know, can bounce back and forth. Do we have different states of geospace? Some people like to define them as very specific states jumping back and forth. Jim has an entire focus group talking about modes of response and trying to bin it into these different groups. You know, are they different bins or is it just sort of a continuum back and forth? Interesting question. And, you know, and you can, and you can look at it in different ways. And, but I think that this is system level science when we're talking about modes of response. Um, a totally different way to look at it is, is to getting into the, the complexity theory side of things and this uh, you know, self-similarity and, and looking for a power law distribution. And uh, one study on that was, uh, was this look at, at auroral brightenings and taking a, a time history integral of the auroral brightenings and lo and behold that integrated size or the total energy going into the system fell on a power law. And so where, you know, on this integrated size and, and total energy input, where that's, that slope is constant, like this, this part right here, says all of this range from you know, very small scale rural brightenings up through isolated substorms is basically the same physics. 
That's what this chart would show you. And, this, and we should let this inform the rest of us when we're taking a look at our particular niche field and whether we're dealing with a system or dealing with our own particular subsystem, uh, you know, very uh, specific um, uh, investigation, we should let this inform us to say, hey, you know, if, if I'm dealing with isolated substorms, it's actually related to smaller brightenings as well. But notice there's a kink in the curve at some point. And over here, this has a different power law spectrum. The complexity theorist would say this over here is a different set of, of it's a different physical regime with a different set of, of uh, dynamical behavior going on. And so this regime over here, this is magnetic storms. And so magnetic storms are a different phenomena from isolated substorms is what this would, this chart informs us. And that, hey, you know, so if you're a, a, you know, one that likes to look at magnetic storms, you know, it's actually a different phenomena from, from looking at those small rural brightenings. And that, that actually, you know, that, we should let that, um, we should take that with us as we're, as we're uh, approaching our own specific um, look at, at regions of, of, uh, of geospace. So, you know, reductionism, you know, this is just boiling it down into the components. And, uh, you know, system level reductionism is when, is when those uh, couplings are non-negligible. And the two big words is time history and feedback. That, you know, if, if those are important for you between your system then it, between your subsystems, you're really doing geospace system level science, even if it's just a few subsystems, if it's not the entirety of geospace. Um, is it necessary? No, we don't all have to be doing you know, system level science. Um, but I think that we should, we should be aware of system level science and let it, um, and, uh, let it help us uh, move forward. And so yeah, so the question to ask is, is are these negligible or important? In what we're in, in our specific thing that we're doing, so um, you know reductionism works, and and a lot of us do it on our particular little component that we're uh, that we're analyzing. But many of us actually do you know reduct system level reductionism, if if that's a oxymoron, a, a, you know we'll, we'll coin a new term here for for geospace science. Then um, you know and like I said that that uh, that the SISM effort the the SWMF effort, many other efforts of try any effort really of trying to couple together various codes and and look at a at a broader context and the influence of of these different subsystems on each other. That is reductionist system level science, um, and I and I believe that there doesn't have to be a rift between complexity theory and this reductionist level system level science. Uh, those two should be informing each other, should be talking to each other, and should get along. So, uh, you know, so we need to stop the protests. Um, but I think this protester said it best, you know, that one of the big things that we lack is, you know, is, uh, is system level data. And, and that would certainly help us um, get over this hump and move forward. So, that's it, thanks. <laughs>